Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about the Air Awakened series. When I say talk about, I mean rant about. So there will be spoilers for the series, but I am largely going to talk about like structural or theme or writing kind of issues, less about like plot stuff. Plot will come into it incidentally because things about how the plot is or is not constructed will be a problem. But like, yeah, so like there will be spoilers, but like it won't be like super focused on that. <laughs> so I don't know, watch it if you want. Why did I pick up this series and why am I ranting about it now? And why did I read the whole fucking series if I hated it? Because I did. So I picked up the first book thinking it would, I, I never really expected it to be amazing, but I thought it'd be like a fun light read, some escapism, you know, just, just a fun read. Um, and the first one, it was that. It was like slightly less good than I had hoped, but it was still that. And so I would, I thought probably the rest of the books would get better. I was very, very wrong. <laughs> but so um, I ended up getting on Audible, you can get the whole series as one massive audiobook um, that doesn't even have breaks in it to see like where you are. Like it doesn't tell you which book you're in. <laughs> it like the narrator will tell you when you've moved on to a new book. It's like a 52 hour audiobook or something with like five books in it. And it was like 20 bucks. Um, so I was like, yeah, let's just get them all. And um, book two was terrible. Definitely substantially worse than the first book. And then I <laughs> felt like maybe it'll still get better. And then I kept listening and I was like, at this point now, it's just I'm on a mission. I just want to finish this because this is making me really angry and it's doing so many things that I hate in books. And so I sort of decided, one, to finish it so that I can sort of like get achievement out of this because I put so much time into it already. Um, and I can't really talk about it until I've read the whole series because I didn't want to have to qualify everything I say by being like, maybe it gets better in the later books or maybe this gets resolved or maybe it improves. I have read them all and I can now say everything conclusively, whether it does or does not get better. And the answer is it does not get better. <laughs> so I wanted to just be done and I didn't want any reason to like have to, again, qualify what I was saying. And I just wanted to like say I did it. <laughs> Plus I had the audiobook, so just fucking finish it. This series did piss me off a lot and I that's why I kind I kind of want to talk about it, but more to the point, it did, it did so many things that piss me off in general when I find it in a book at all, and it did so many of them in one series that it just seemed to me an excellent opportunity to go through all the things that a book could possibly do to piss me off as a reader. So this is about Air Awakens, this video. However, I'm using Air Awakens as the vehicle through which to examine how a book can be bad, in my opinion. There are other ways, I suppose, that a book could be bad that Air Awakens doesn't do, but it does a hell of a lot of things that I hate. So I feel like by watching this, by going through all of these, you will, by the end, have a very solid idea of what is like to piss me off in a book, just generally, um, and what books in future I will probably dislike if they are in any way like this. So I feel like it's helpful to you <laughs> to know what it is about a book that may piss me off, because then in the future... I mean, if you, for example, love the Air Awakens series and none of the things I'm talking about would piss you off, then in the future when I dislike a book that, I mean, you can assume that it probably does those things. And if you know that doesn't bother you, then you don't need to trust my opinion because clearly the things that bother me don't bother you. So we're going to examine the Air Awakens series. But in so doing, we're going to examine my tastes as a reader. So some background about what Air Awakens is about. Um, it's not about a hell of a lot, which like, that's sort of the first issue is that I prefer books to have a very interesting plot and world and set up. I can like a book if it has a very thin plot and a very thin world if it's doing a really deep dive into the characters. So I can't think of a whole lot of examples of that, but I mean, the in Radiance by Grace Draven, um, the world building and the plot, well, <laughs> To me, the world building and plot is more substantial in that 200 page book than all of the Air Wagon series. But it's not really so much about the world and about like a super intricate plot as it is just about the characters. So I prefer to have a strong plot and strong world building, but I can forgive that. So Air Wagons, <laughs> it's a fantasy series. Um, it's mainly romance. 
like that's basically the driving force of the plot is this romance that was nauseating and the thing is <laughs> I feel like I need to structure this better but the thing about this is that if the book sort of the tone of it it purported to be about that if it sort of came off as knowing that that's what it's about that I am a romance book this is what I am about this is what is most important in my plot well I probably wouldn't have picked it up but it, I would it would be honest to me and I would look at it and think okay this is a romance book it knows it's a romance book that's what it's trying to be this book both in terms of the marketing and the cover as well as the way the story is told you get this feeling that the book thinks it's like an epic fantasy but it's definitely not it's just a romance where the fantasy elements are present exclusively for the purpose of generating and orchestrating situations that will create drama that will create stakes for the romance that's so it's not romance being incidental to or being somewhat significant to a fantasy plot the fantasy plot serves the romance plot in a very direct way the fantasy moments the stakes in the fantasy story the when magic goes wrong or goes right it's all in service to the romance plot and again if the book purported to be a romance pretty much exclusively I wouldn't enjoy it but I would be okay with the fact of it if that makes sense I would feel like the that book is being honest with itself and with me as the reader um, but the book seems to think it's a fantasy and it's not it's a romance so okay fine I mean by the end of the first by the end of the first book, I had my suspicions. And by the end of the second book, I was sure that this was pretty much just going to be romance centric. I didn't actually talk about what it's about. I'll circle back to that in a second. <laughs> so I, it was clear to me that this would be a romance centric book pretty early on. And so I had kind of switched gears in my brain to stop criticizing in my mind the magic rules or the politics so much and accept that what is going to be the focus here is the romance. And then the romance was also bad. <laughs> okay, so back to what the plot is it's sort of elemental magic there is this sort of sense it's alluded to frequently and again this is only brought into it when it serves the romance plot but there's sort of stigma against people who can use magic people who are non-magical commons as they are referred to very clever um they they hate and fear people who can use elemental magic but the the prince the heir to the throne is a very powerful like user of elemental magic his younger half-brother doesn't have magic and everyone in the kingdom loves his younger half-brother because he's like the cute light-hearted charming one and the older one is like brooding tm and the a user of dark magic and our main character vala she's a librarian and she it is discovered that she has this elemental power that hasn't been seen in the kingdom's in a really long time like really long time like they were it was like extinct kind of this form of magic so she's a a wind walker hence air awakens because she has the elemental power of air now what she's able to do with that power it really it depends on what the plot needs and there's a lot of things that she can do that don't really seem like air power to me <laughs> but that's her power and the prince uh, the brooding prince and you guessed it those are the two who are the romantically involved his power is fire. That's pretty much the setup. And then there's there's like the the king wants to invade another area because basically it's just like a conquering kind of story where he just wants to expand his power. Sort of the Roman style of just like conquer everywhere as much as you can just because you can. So he wants to use Vala's power to help him in that endeavor. So that's pretty much the plot throughout all of the books like that's what's going on is war for the purpose of expansion and then the king wanting to use Vala but not being okay with his son the prince being romantically involved with not a commons because those are non-magic folk with a commoner because that's what she is oh and then the thing that also made almost zero sense is that there's crystal magic so there's these, sort of these evil crystals and it kind of it seems like they enhance these magical powers but are also sort of toxic and overwhelm their user it's not super well explained and it doesn't again it's really only brought into the story to create drama or suspense not really to world build <laughs> 
So that's sort of the setup of Air Awakens. So already, like I said, the plot is thin, the world building is bad and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's a lot of things that could be interesting. I mean, anytime you have um, allegorical stories sort of where magic is serving the place of race or religion and people are being persecuted for something magical that we don't have in our world, but it's clear that this is going to be used to tell a story that we would recognize because prejudice and, and xenophobia and all this sort of thing those are common themes in our non-magical world that we could recognize. I apologize if you can hear, there are wood chipping, tree trimming things going on next door. Hopefully you can't hear too much of that. I can hear it, but I feel like with the mic, you won't be able to hear it. If you can't hear it, I apologize. Okay, so yeah, the plot is non-existent and bad. So the driving force of this story is Vala coming into her own realizing that she has these powers because she thinking she's a non-magic person has also sort of harbored this prejudice and has been around people who harbor this prejudice so she's sort of like shocked to learn that she has these powers which is fine like I would be shocked too um and then immediately like the person who discovers she has these powers is the prince so she's already like immediately having the hots for a prince who she shouldn't be having the hots for because he's the prince and then he's very much the brooding silent type who like doesn't tell her what he's thinking or feeling and is acting like why would you matter to me on a personal level you're just you know one of my subjects and you have these magic powers so I as a fellow magic wielder am interested in your progress but it's totally platonic even though it's very obvious to the reader that neither of these characters feels platonically for the other but you know whatever so it's a lot of him sort of bringing trying to draw her out so she'll use her powers um, and then introducing her to other people who also use magic. His brother is actually the one character in the story that I kind of liked. And his brother is around to sort of, again, create tension and drama because the, he's the attractive flirty prince. So there's constantly jealousy, which doesn't really make sense. But the, there's jealousy brought into the story where the older brother, Aldrich, he's the brooding one, he gets constantly jealous whenever his younger brother shows Vala attention, even though he kind of asks him to because she needs help and protection and he can't always be around. So he does ask his younger brother to sort of extend the royal hand of protection to Vala, which he does. But then his younger brother also does cause drama because he warns Vala that she shouldn't like be in love with Aldrich because Aldrich is a mean and brooding and angsty dude so she shouldn't trust what he has to say and that he can be two-faced and whatever so there's just like constantly misinformation and drama that is very painfully obvious and is again really just there to create more uncertainty and drama now what i hated the most the most about this series and this series does this constantly constantly which is why I hated it so much because the rest of what I've just described is not ideal but it's you know it's whatever it's twofold telling and not showing and completely unearned moments and I it drove me nuts <laughs> oh side note also what drove me nuts is the author's constant use of the word such um in a way that does not make sense like I don't think she knows like English <laughs> you were constantly using the word such in in, a se in sentences where it didn't make sense to have it. Um, and I'm trying to think of an example. I wish I'd highlighted one um, while well, I was listening to it on audiobook. I should have written it down, but I don't know how to explain it. But they use the word such way more than you'd ever would, even if you're using it correctly. So like they would say phrases like, you know, why would we believe such? And it's not wrong, but it's strange. And there were instances where it was definitely straight up wrong. So I can't even craft a sentence in my mind right now because it's wrong. So I can't do it. There are moments when I was like, no, that one literally is wrong. But other times when it was just awkward. And it, it almost came across as the author attempting to sound kind of old timey, even though the whole tone of the, all, all the books and the dialogue is very modern and very casual. But then they would throw in phrases like and such so that it would sound old timey, I think, was the thinking there. It, it doesn't work. And it's wrong. It's like literally wrong for like the English language. <laughs> Okay, so back to telling and not showing. Um, it's So these characters are in love. And we get a little bit of the sort of initial, their relationship getting to know each other. But once it's established that they're in love with each other, which is pretty early on, after that, it's just, they're just in love. 
And all they ever talk about is the being in love. And all they ever talk about to each other is being in love. And that's, that's it. Like, there's no, no reason to love the other, if that makes sense. So if I see a relationship that I really root for and I believe in, there's more to it. Like, they get along really well. They have a good rapport. They trust each other. They have a good sense of humor. They have been there for each other. Whereas this is just constantly, I love you so much, I can't live without you. You're my one and only. I could never love another. But why? It's all they ever talk about to each other and to other people who are patient enough to listen to this bullshit is how much they love each other. And it's just, I can't, like, after a while, it's it's just, it doesn't mean anything when you're constantly saying it. And the fact that the main character, the main male character, Aldrich, is painted as being this brooding and silent type, but he's literally constantly verbalizing his affection, which is unbelievable to me. He cannot be this swoon-worthy, brooding, silent type and constantly be vocalizing his affection. I mean, the whole reason that a brooding character is so swoon-worthy in a lot of stories is because they rarely ever, ever speak about emotion. And so when they do, in that rare instance, when they do, it means so much more because you know that they normally wouldn't do this so that they must feel that strongly that they're willing to put words to it. So constantly telling me, the narrative is constantly telling me that this character is a brooding and silent type, but what you're showing me is him constantly vocalizing his affection, constantly. And so it loses that impact. The whole reason that's ever swoonworthy is because of how limitedly, that's not a word, maybe it is, I don't know, but you have to use it sparingly. So if you have, you know, Mr. Darcy, who's been like a prick for the entire book, and then finally kind of lets his guard down and confesses like the depth of his affection, that's why that moment, still to this day, women are swooning over it. It wasn't my favorite because I don't actually go for this, the brooding type that much, but I, I get the appeal. I get why that feels so significant. And even when I watch it, like it's not my favorite, but I get why that moment is so significant because... It's a big deal that this person who comes across as very unemotional most of the time is suddenly allowing you to see their emotions. That's a big deal. So just, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You cannot tell me that this character is brooding all the time, but then constantly have them be showing their emotions. It's, it's as though the author wanted to have that Mr. Darcy moment of confession, but on every page. And because it's on every page, it loses its potency. And it, it's no longer swoonworthy because the whole reason that it is swoonworthy is because you sort of have to earn it. And there's just no willingness on the author's part here to earn it, to make us wait, to make us wonder and 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 doubt for long enough to where when that we feel that relief of the confession of emotion, that it is so significant. I mean, like the only thing I can compare it to is sort of a hunger versus constantly eating. Like if you snack throughout the day, at no point are you just like, oh my god, I'm so hungry, and then you take a bite of something and you're like, yes. Because that's what the Mr. Darcy moment is. It's a constant hunger for affection, and then when you get that moment, even if it's a small bite of a saltine cracker, just that little bit of like slight hint of emotion, you're starving for it, and you're like, yes. But if you're constantly telling me how much he loves her, and he's constantly saying how much he loves her to her, to anyone that will listen, I'm not hungry for it. In fact, I'm... I'm feeling a little stuffed. <laughs> and I mean, this got to the point where in addition to just talking about not being able to live without her, he his like pet name for her, if you can call it that, is My Lady, My Love. And I, I can't tell if it's on every page because I was listening to an audiobook, but it's certainly in the frequency of its mention, it seemed to me that it was every page that he called her My Lady, My Love, sometimes multiple times within like the same sentence. And it was, it was nauseating because it was constant. And just wasn't cute anymore. Again, the referring, I didn't realize I would be using Mr. Darcy as my comparison here, but let's go back to Mr. Darcy. In the film with Keira Knightley, at the end when he has like a moment where he's asking her like what he should call her as a pet name, and he calls her Mrs. Darcy. And it's like a cute moment. It's a cute moment because it's a moment. <laughs> and it's just that moment. If Mr. Darcy had been had spent the entire movie calling her my pearl and my lovely and Mrs. Darcy. You'd be like, Ugh. so that's what happens here. Like this brooding character who's not like, they bring in the brooding when he needs to be angsty and piss her off. Or when he's like, I can't talk about emotions anymore because I, I'm, emotions are hard for me, don't you know? And I'm like, are they? Cause you seem to want to talk about them all the time. But uh, right, that's right. You don't like talking about emotion. That's why 
in this specific instance, you're suddenly having issues with it because the plot needs you to create drama. But yeah, he was just constantly saying, my lady, my love. My lady, my love. My lady, my love. My Vala. My lady, my love. My lady, my love. <laughs> and like, I was out loud at that point because it happened so much. When he would say it, I would out loud be like, oh, we wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to call her your lady. Is she your love? Is she? Yes, she is. I was doubting it for a second because I hadn't heard it for a minute. <laughs> okay, so the non-brooding, brooding dude whose sole purpose in life is to express his love and affection for Vala is... It's not swoon-worthy, and it's not interesting. It's it's very two-dimensional, and again, even if it was just a pulpy romance, you need to play it right. <laughs> I can get sucked into that with the best of them. I mean, that I eh, called myself trash for Shatter Me, and Shatter Me does it better. Shatter Me is an angsty romance, but it knows how to pace it in a way to get you swooning over it. How to withhold that affection, how to withhold those emotions until you're begging for them. And then when they're given to you, you're like, yes, you, there's a formula here and <laughs> you didn't do it right. Okay, so then Vala is insufferable. And in addition, so for her storyline, it's a lot of the romance where she's constantly saying that she can't live without that guy. And then when he does things to piss her off, she gets irrationally angry about it, but then is also understanding about it. And it's very inconsistent. But what pisses me off most about her is how insufferably selfish she is. So there's constant, like she, obviously she's going through things, figuring out these, emo these magical powers, her feelings over a prince that she shouldn't have feelings for, and then feelings for him because the king is mad about it. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. But every character around her is constantly worried about her. Is constantly checking up on her, making sure she's emotionally okay, and giving her, you know, therapy, basically. And the characters around her, they're also going through a lot because there's, like, war going on. So they're also suffering and their loved ones are dying. And she forgets about them constantly. And sometimes the narrative even tells us that she's forgotten about them and that she kind of feels guilty about the fact that, wow, they always check up on her and she's been a terrible friend. And when I got to those parts, I was like, hey, you fucking are. You're a terrible friend. I don't know why they give a shit about you. I wouldn't. You're selfish. So selfish. And so everyone around her suddenly just constantly is willing to put aside whatever their own issues are and do everything in the world to help her. They're always so worried about her and that they're always swearing to be there for her no matter what she needs. And I'm like, good God, why? Why are all these people suddenly laying down their lives for her, suddenly willing to sacrifice their own emotional well-being for her? She has not earned this. And that's when I was talking about earlier about things being unearned. She has not done anything to earn this kind of loyalty or this kind of affection from these people. If, he, if it was like a brother that is like, you know, family ties or a childhood friend maybe, but these are people that she's just met because they work with the prince. And now he's like, you know, help her out. And now they're almost more loyal to her than they are to him. And there's no reason for it. And they're constantly saying, again, vocalizing things like, we'll always be there for you. And because she'll, she'll somewhat you know, allude to the fact that she feels guilty about how much attention she's uh, requiring from them and that, oh, they shouldn't worry so much about her. And they take every opportunity to tell her that they'll always worry about her because she's so fucking amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, is she though? And then part two of unearned moments is that people who do not like her or people who do not know her purse. Apologies, I had to pause because the wood chipping was getting insane. Um, I think they're powering down now. So we can talk again. I don't know where I was. Um, okay, unearned moments that I think I was talking about. Yeah. So the emotionally unearned moments of people being affectionate towards her for no reason piss me off a lot. But again, people who are not emotionally tied to her, this is not emotionally unearned moments. This is coming now uh, to her, to her intelligence, her wit, her military strategy, her powers. There's so many instances of characters for no reason, unprompted, finding every excuse to praise her. And again, it's unearned and frustrating for that reason. So in the same way that in a romance plot, if you starve the reader and the characters of the affection that when you finally deliver it, it is so much more satisfying. So she's constantly being told how brilliant she is, how intelligent she is. And the way this is achieved is twofold. One, it's just told all the time. It's just the constantly the, the narrative finds excuses to say this about her, that she's intelligent, witty, brilliant, blah, 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 which, okay, unearned. And then the moments where it is earned, this is achieved only through painting the other characters as absolute morons. So I don't know if this is just simply that the author is herself 
not able to construct because it's usually in in situations of like military strategy. So I don't know if this is because the author herself has such a limited grasp of military strategy that in order for the main character to have a brilliant idea, everyone else has to like literally not know what a good military strategy would be. But at that point, if that's what you're going to do, take something where you actually know something or make it entirely magical where you have the rules yourself. Because when they're just talking about tactics for a battle, there's literally moments where all these people who are military leaders who are now trying to figure out how best to achieve this invasion or whatever it is, and they're pouring over maps and discussing it. And she shows up and everyone's just like, oh, what does this little girl know? And then she's going to show them who's boss, which everyone loves those moments. Let's not lie. There's They're just as satisfying as the Darcy moments for different reasons. There's a reason this works in movies. There's a reason people keep doing it the underdog situation. So having all these dudes be like, oh, what does this little girl know? The idea of her showing them up would be very satisfying. Except there, it, it's so painfully basic to where you wonder why these people would be at all in charge of armies, where they're looking at this and going, well, if we put all our forces and march them towards this gate, they'll see us coming and we'll all die. And they're like, what will we do? And she's like, haha, what if we split our forces? And they're like, Sounds like we should listen to girls like her more often. There's more than a pretty face here. Looks like she's got a brilliant mind there as well. And I, does she? Or is everyone else there a moron? I, if these are the only earned moments we're going to get, I'm, I think we're better off with just being told and not shown. Because it made all of the telling that much more painful to listen to because the, mo the few moments of proof that you have to go off of actually make her look stupider. So if I never got to see any instance of her supposedly showing off her brilliance, I'd have nothing to go on except people saying it, so I'd have to believe it. But now I've seen the thing that they're basing this off of, and I can confirm that she is not brilliant. <laughs> so all of the telling is that much worse, because the little bit of showing I got, it was proof to the contrary. So throughout the series, it's just constantly, literally constantly brooding, will they or won't they? And even when they are together, worried about being parted and they cannot live without each other. And they've mentioned this now many, 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 many times. They constantly make choices, putting their own love story before the good of the nation, the good of other people. And yet constantly people are laying down their lives saying they would die for them, that they are going to be the best leaders they could ever hope for because these are the people that really should be in power. And so all these people rallying to them for no reason, because these are the two most selfish, self-indulgent, self-obsessed individuals I've ever read about. But they somehow gain all of this adoration, which is again, unearned. If there were moments there, again, this is another thing that works very well in many books and many movies, and that's why it works, because people like seeing it when your main character is finally scraped their way th through, you know, the mire of whatever situation the plot has put them in. They have fought their way to the top. They've helped people along the way. And finally, people are noticing and finally people are rallying to them and saying, you know what, I'll, I will support you and I will die for you. And those moments feel epic, but only because they are earned. So when you have two entirely self-obsessed individuals moaning on about how much they love each other and out of nowhere, there's people showing up being like, we will die for you. Why? Why on earth would you lay down your lives for these people? They clearly don't even know what they're doing when it comes to military strategy. So it's not even like if they were not great people, but they know their shit. I'd be like, well, they'll make good leaders at least because they may be super selfish, but they know what they're doing. They do not know what they're doing. There's an instance in, I think it's in the last book where um, they're sort of on the outs now. There's been a kind of a coup type situation. And um, a lot of people think that she is dead. I think they think Aldrich is dead too. Um, and so there's these people sort of losing faith and and are sort of going to accept now that this new rule, which is oppressive, that they're going to fight against. And so to rally these townspeople, Vala gets up in front of them all and announces herself as who she is, uh, basically declaring that she's not dead, which is already like, well, there goes the element of surprise. Like you could have probably worked against your enemy longer if no one knows you're alive, but okay, fine. Maybe getting people's support is arguably worth the sacrifice of your anonymity, fine. And then she not only tells them that she's alive and she exists and here she is, she tells these townspeople exactly what their next move is, what they've been planning on doing, like where they're going next and where they plan to sort of build their support or whatever it is. And um, after she makes this little speech, Aldrich's like, 
maybe not a great idea to tell people that, but you know, you're still learning this whole leadership thing. And she's like, oh yeah, you're right. I probably shouldn't have said that. I was like, no, you fucking shouldn't. You're such an idiot. If this was just some like 12 year old chosen one who has very recently been chosen and did something that stupid, I would already think it was stupid, but I'd be like, okay, this is book five. She's already been called brilliant multiple times. She's already displayed her just natural instincts for military strategy, which again, we have seen is not great. And then she does this and Aldrick is like, it's not a subtle moment of like, like not grasping the subtleties of political machinations and subtext where I could imagine a situation like that where because, you know, you haven't been in court before, so you don't get all the subtext. So you possibly say something that you shouldn't have. And he's like, okay, well, so you shouldn't have said this because of these reasons. I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't know. This is very basic stuff. <laughs> like, if you can't grasp this on your own, I don't know why anyone thinks you're brilliant. And then again, in her, in him training her how to be a future leader, about how to be a queen and all these sort of things, Again, the author clearly doesn't have any examples of how this would go. So there's lots and lots of long sort of paragraphs just telling us a montage of Aldrich would come to her every day and pose to her scenarios about political situations and have her tell him what she would do. And then he would nudge and prod and question her until she got to a different answer. So it's just like very general broad strokes describing how he's helping her to hone her skills. But there's no examples of it because clearly the author doesn't have any ideas for like, she wants Aldrich to come off as the brilliant guide and, and Vala to come off as the, the brilliant but ignorant ingenue who's figuring it out, but picking it up very quickly because she's so brilliant. No examples of it. And the very few examples we have paint them both as morons. So this book series, <laughs> the I don't even really have anything to say about the magic plot because again, it's only people suddenly have abilities or don't have abilities or find limits to their abilities just to create tension. The whole thing with the crystals doesn't make sense. It never made sense. And I have read all the books and I still don't really get it. It was really just there to create tension. The villain is extremely snidely whiplash, like very obviously a villain. There's there could have been something interesting with this whole prejudice against magic people, but it doesn't actually make sense in the way this world is constructed and the way that people react because this prince has magic. So it's not I'm not saying it's not believable that people would have issues with their own heir to the throne. But to this degree, like they paint the prejudice against magic to be so stark, like they are basically pariahs. But your prince is one. And they don't paint him as being such a pariah that people sort of have begrudgingly accepted this about him. And that does not work for me. They wouldn't be that okay with it. Either they are somewhat okay with magic people or they are evil pariahs that should really just be killed. So this halfway between the two, it really doesn't work. Because if it's going to be that way, there needs to be so much more world building to explain this layered situation of sort of competing ideas and cognitive dissonance among the people that could be interesting but that is not gone into and really all these things only exist so that there's moments of tension where people are suddenly attacking her for having magic so that there can be a, a brooding angsty moment which again is unearned and unexplained and it it waters down the tension of the situation the main characters are two-dimensional like idiots like straight up idiots <laughs> and whatever we were told about them we're told that she's brilliant and she proves herself to be stupid. We're told that he's brooding and silent, but he's constantly vocalizing his emotions. So neither, neither character is living up to what we're being told about them. And there's these epic, epic moments of war and battle and death, they mean nothing because they're not earned. So in summation, those are all the things that will piss me off in a book. You can have an angsty romance, but you have to do it right. You have to know how, how this works, how to play it out, how to pace it out so that people will go for it. And I know there's people who like these books, but I don't get it. And I think they would, those same people, I think, would like them even more if it paced things better. And then people like me wouldn't hate them. And all I can say is if you cannot show the moments that you, that would demonstrate the abilities that your characters have, you need to be so much more subtle and clever about telling them. Because I totally appreciate that if you're writing about a character that's meant to be more brilliant than you are personally, that might be difficult. But... As an author, that's your job now to work out that puzzle. I mean, Pierce Brown talked about how difficult he finds it reading, uh, writing the character of Mustang because as far as he's concerned, Mustang is much more brilliant than he is. So how do you write about a character that's smarter than you? Well, go read Pierce Brown's books. He does a fine job of it. You create scenarios and situations that paint that character in that way and are as detailed as you can be, but 
if you do not have that brilliance, you have to work around it. And the way to work around it isn't to just have other characters be stupid <laughs> or other characters out of the blue, completely out of character, just suddenly talking about how brilliant this character is. Because it's unearned and unbelievable. For these military strategists who have just, again, going back to Vala in a military strategy meeting, who have just declared that she would never know anything. And it's a clearly a matter of pride for them. So if she really did rattle off something that was brilliant, which she didn't, but let's say that she did. Let's say that she really showed them up and pointed out something that was pure brilliance in terms of military strategy. These people, the way that humans operate, they would still naysay her because this is a matter of pride for them. They wouldn't suddenly be like, well, she's just so brilliant and we're just so stupid. Like we should listen to her. They would not. Their whole careers and lives are built on their reputations here. That's why they have these positions. They would not stand by and let her make them look stupid and they wouldn't praise her for it. That is not how humans work. So that everything about that moment in the book piss me off because it doesn't make sense for the minor characters. It doesn't make sense for her. Everyone looks like an idiot and no one's acting like people would. And it's all this entire scene, the entire purpose of this scene has been to convey to us and to prove to us how brilliant she is. And it has done the exact opposite. And yet so much of the story rests upon our belief in that foundation of the love and the brilliance and the whatever. And it all crumbles because the foundation does not exist. None of this is earned. So yeah, that's my take on the Air Awakened series and every way that a book can go wrong. Yeah, <laughs> I don't recommend the series. That said, a lot of people like the series. And if the things that I just described do not bother you, if you don't care if a moment is earned because you just like the epicness of it, or, or if you like constantly hearing a man say, my lady, my love, then this is the book for you. I found it a bit much. Let me know in the comments down below how you feel about the way books are structured, I guess, because that's kind of more what this was about than about Air Awakens specifically. Yeah, if the kind of stuff I described does bother you, if it doesn't bother you, if you read the Air Awakens series and you felt the same way or you felt the complete opposite, if you thought it did deliver on its promises, if you thought it didn't deliver on those promises, but you enjoyed it anyway and why, you know, all the things. <laughs> I post videos on Saturdays, so like and subscribe, and I'll see you next Saturday.